system, looking at the relationship between perpetrators, collaborators, and healers. So Shemil, without further ado, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, and then once we finish with your talk, we'll return to the conversation. Um, Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. As it was said, I am the Anglican chaplain at Oxford Brookes University, and it is such a privilege to be with you today. Do put Christian's questions up in the chat function, and I look forward to the discussions at the end. Though I am not representing the church in this talk in any way, I am a member of Anglican Church and with a particular role. I am wearing a dog collar, and my views are biased by my own identity and experience. The title I have chosen for uh, this talk is Christianity and Racism, Perpetrator, Collaborator and Healer. I have chosen two pictures to uh, go on my initial slide. The first is a picture of Jesus on the cross to remind myself that Christianity started as a religion of persecuted minority. The second is that of a lynching tree, so that I can reflect on how this religion of persecuted minorities became a religion that supported practices such as slavery, lynching, and racism. Here is a basic outline uh, for today, uh, and uh, we, the talk should last about 20 minutes, and we will have plenty of time for discussion and uh, conversations. Christianity, from the very beginning, was a very diverse faith, despite the fact that Jesus and the majority of early believers were Jews. Rabbi Sachs says that even the Hebrew Bible itself is a book that celebrates diversity. In his, books, uh, in his book, uh, The Dignity of Difference, he says, we encounter God in the face of a stranger. That, I believe, is the Hebrew Bible's single greatest and most counterintuitive contribution to ethics. God creates differences. Therefore, it is in one who is different that we meet God. Let me read that last sentence again. God creates differences. Therefore, it is in one who is different that we meet God. It is believed that church as we know today was born on the day of Pentecost. It is a day that Jewish people of that time celebrated harvest of fruit. As it was a festival day, the, uh, Jerusalem was filled with people from everywhere. We are told that Jesus' disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and saw tongues of fire descending upon them. At which point they started speaking in all the languages spoken by those gathered. It is essential to note that the foreigners were not taught the language of the disciples, but that the disciples were given a gift to speak the language of the foreigners. Christianity is not a religion that advocates homogeneity but it is a religion that tells its followers to go to the ends of the world and make disciples of all nations, and thus should promote diversity. We are all different tribes and nations. We may speak different languages. We may have different customs, but we are interconnected by our common humanity. One could argue that Christianity is uh, is, uh, is an easily translatable religion. Lemon Senna, a theologian of our times, said this, Christianity is a religion of over 2,000 different language groups in the world. More people pray and worship in more languages in Christianity than any other religion in the world. Let us move on uh, uh, to uh, our th theme today uh, about Christianity as a perpetrator and collaborator of oppression. As the first picture, the first picture in this slide is the beginning of Christianity's unholy alliance with the empire. The second picture is of a battle involving British East India Company. 
The first picture depicts a famous story from AD 312, where the Roman Emperor Constantine, on his way to battle, sees the sign of the cross in the sky with the writing, conquer with this sign. To cut the story short, he fights in the name of the cross and wins the battle. Influenced by this vision and experience, he later converts to Christianity. This was a game changer for Christianity and Christians. From, this, from the time of Jesus' crucifixion to this point, Christianity was a persecuted religion. Christians were persecuted mercilessly by Jews as well as the Roman Empire. But from this point from of conversion of Constantine, Christianity becomes the religion of the empire. The shift from the religion of someone who was crucified by the empire to an imperial religion is crucial. And it is the story that has continued for the next 2,000 years or still continuing. Christianity becomes synonymous with many empires. We see religious leaders becoming even more powerful than the emperors themselves. By the time we get to the British Empire, Christianity is well and truly an imperial religion, with church and state so closely intertwined that political power often lies more in church than the political establishment itself. Perhaps this is where we get the saying for God and country, because they were often presented by leaders as one and the same. We also need to see that the irony of church becoming rich. Jesus was a leader who proudly declared, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but he does not have anywhere to lay his head. Disciples in the early church sold all their positions and lived in communities so that they may be able to serve one another. But by the time we get to Middle Ages, we see church becoming richer than the state itself. We need to acknowledge that the empire building of the 15th, 16th and 18th centuries is heavily influenced by the Enlightenment thinking. In accepting René Descartes' declaration, I think, therefore I am, the church and its philosophy became far more individualistic than communal. Enlightenment encouraged 15th century Protestant Reformation, further encouraged individualism through presenting a form of Christianity which emphasized eternal salvation through personal faith instead of a communal living practiced by early Christians. Enlightened think men thinking also encouraged people to categorize and study the world and its content, which included people. The age of discovery opened up a whole new world of exotic people and things to be learned about and categorized. This is where we see the creation of so-called scientific race categories by Blumenbach. We know now there is no scientific evidence for these categories as is described in the slide, but they continue to influence our thinking and behavior. This unholy alliance of empire and religion gave birth to the white man's burden to colonize, evangelize, and stabilize the new places and new people groups. This burden is also visible in the literatures of the time. In the next slide, we see a picture depicting the punishment of Caliban in the Shakespearean drama, The Tempest. As Edward Said said, if you look through a post-colonial lens at this Shakespearean drama, it is hard not to see Prospero as a colonizer, Caliban as the savage native, and Miranda, a person interested in civilizing and educating the savage as a missionary. Hymns and other songs used in churches during uh, uh, this time contains such narratives too. 
this particular hymn that I've given on the slide speaks of the beautiful new lands being explored. But the last few lines cannot be clearer. The job of the new explorer is to correct them, teach them, educate them in the civilized religion and civilization itself. Early colonizers and explorers such as Christopher Columbus saw themselves, despite their raping, killing and exploiting what they did uh, to the new groups of people as the representatives of God himself. Following on that, this period witnesses the development of an uh, often surge in white supremacist theology. We see Jesus, who was clearly a Middle Eastern man, becoming more and more white in pictures and icons. We see narratives arguing that people with darker complexion are the descendants of cursed son of Noah, giving white people divine right to enslave them. The Bible is very clear from the very beginning that human beings are created in the image of God. During the time of slavery, we see emergence of books such as this one, which argue that black men and women are not human beings, thus not to be considered the image of God. Taking away one's humanity is only one step away from slavery and genocide. People were transported, not even like cattle, but like worms on board of slave ships. This was made possible because the theology was constructed, which supported the understanding that he, these human beings are not people. Again, coming to our times, racism is a crime because it denies one's humanity. It denies one's right to live. Now, one might ask, what about the role of church in anti-slavery movements? It is true that many of the abolitionists in England were members of Church of England. We know the stories of William Wilberforce and the like. However, we also need to acknowledge that stories are these stories are often one-sided and are far too often these stories become the narrative of great white saviors. We forget that abolition, the movement itself was necessitated, necessitated by slavery. We forget that the majority of the church supported slavery at one point. While we remember and celebrate the white abolitionists, we forget the black anti-slavery leaders such as Mary uh, Prince, Olandre Quano. Moreover, we forget the hundreds of thousands of men and women who were enslaved. A classic example of this is the story of Sambo, the slave boy, who died at Sunderland Point in Lancashire. Sutherland Point today is just a pastor land, but it was a leading slavery port in the 17th and 18th centuries. Sambo was a young slave boy who died serving his master. In the middle of uh, uh, this now pastor land, we can see his grave. As you can see from the pic picture, it is a very humble grave, but there is a plaque. There is very little written about this boy who lost his family and was enslaved and abused as a child. The story tells us about the head teacher who was kind enough to denote, uh, 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 donate a piece of land so that he uh, could be buried. Of course, there is no mention and very few of us ask why he was not worthy enough to be buried in the churchyard. There was, of course, a church nearby. There is no question that Christian, Christianity was exported uh, from the West to the rest of the world through the growth of trade in the colonial era. Traders were followed by the armies, which were accompanied by chaplains, who were in fact the first missionaries. However, the post-colonial era has seen a dramatic shift in the distribution of numbers of people who adhere to Christianity. 
For example, in 1900s, 83% of Christians lived in North America and Europe. But by 2007, 67% of Christians lived in Global South. Today, the statistical center of gravity for Christianity is somewhere in Timbuktu. It might have even moved because today that is mentioned here is 2007. And you can also see the numbers of church numbers in other countries in the Global South. Yes, there is no question that Western missionary movement did breathe a new life into Christian mission. But less acknowledged fact is that the growth of Christianity uh, in, uh, in the previously colonial world did not happen in the colonial era, but only after the native Christians of those places took the lead. Let us look at a graph portraying the growth of Christianity uh, in Africa. You can see that in 1950s, when the colonial empire started crumbling, the number of Christians started to shoot up. There is a need to comprehensively study to discover the reasons for it. But I wonder if one of the reasons is that people found it difficult to believe in the religion of their oppressor, slave master and abuser. Popularist politicians today, such as Donald Trump, may claim because he's a rich white man to be the true representative of Christians, but he is not. Christian, Christianity remains the religion of the global poor and minorities. For example, the average Anglican today is not a white middle-class man. It is a black teenage girl living in the global south, for example, somewhere like Nigeria. Let me come closer to home and address the issue of uh, racism within church. Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby, has openly said that Church of England is institutionally racist, so this is not a secret. Over the years as a church, we have failed to include people of color. Church not only failed uh, to nurture diversity, it also rejected diversity that arrived on its doorstep. This is the story of the migrants of Windrush, gener Windrush generation and the many thousands that followed. Many of these migrants were Anglicans from other parts of the world coming home to their mother church, but they were rejected. West Indian Anglicans were often described within the church as a community rejected by mother country and mother church. Again, going back to the Archbishop of Canterbury, he said, we did not recognize that we belong to one another, that we, called, we, are, we were called by Christ to love one another, and so the church of England lost the new life that they brought and what God was trying to offer us through them. Now, now I would like to uh, uh, get to the final point. Can Christianity be the healer of racism? Yes, I believe Christianity has the capacity to be the healer because it is extensively a diverse, existentially a diverse religion and teaches the hope of a diverse future. Christianity is a religion built on diversity from the very beginning and continues to be a diverse religion globally and locally. Secondly, the hope that Christianity teaches or the heaven that it believes in, uh, uh, believes in is a very diverse place. The Bible speaks very clear, very little about heaven. But in the brief descriptions we get, there are very clear indications of diversity. For example, we read in the book of Revelation, after this I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. Finally, I would like to present three proposals uh, to Christianity and the Christian church today. 
First of all, I would like to suggest that Church of England, especially as a colonial church, should reconcile with its past. Here's a picture from Archbishop Canterbury's visit to India last year. He visited the memorial at Jallianwala Bag where in 1919, the British colonial army blocked the only entrance to an enclosed garden where thousands of Indians gathered to participate in peaceful protest and opened fire on them. Archbishop Justin decided to prostrate himself in front of the memorial as an act of repentance to apologize for this massacre. Adding to the significance of this act is that many British political and religious leaders have visited Amritsar, including David Cameron while he was the Prime Minister, but lacked the courage to apologize. Some critics in church and uh, in broader society have argued that Archbishop had nothing to apologize for. But that is not true. The Church of England is the established church of our land. And it is part of what our government has done in the past, whether we like it or not. The second proposal is that we should understand the present. We as Christians and as a nation should understand that Christianity is not the religion of white middle class men. It is the religion of the poor. It is the religion of the minorities in this country and other parts of the world. This realization should help the church to develop a much humbler theology of receptivity. We saw racism is a denial of a person's humanity, a humble theology that is receptive uh, to the present is, I believe, the only way to ensure that we as a religion will never again deny a brother or sister of ours that their common humanity. The third proposal is that church should prepare for a diverse future. Churches past and present are full of attempts for homogeneity. Yet, as we saw, Christianity supposedly believe in a diverse heaven. Allow me to conclude by saying that if you are a Christian, and if you struggle to accept your neighbor or a friend who is different from you, just think how uncomfortable you will be in a heaven where all tribes and nations come together. Thank you very much.